Welcome to Home and Away, a little bit different of a podcast episode that we do on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. Really, the whole point of Home and Away is to bring on different perspectives onto our podcast feed, the No Ceilings platform, right? You know, if you're listening to this podcast episode, you're familiar with my show, aka the Draft Deeper podcast. You are familiar with the Draft Act. You're familiar with both of the Tylers presenting different podcast content, but as much as we like to do shows with one another, we all kind of sat around and we, th- we thought we need to be able to bring on guests and have different perspectives on this show. That's certainly something I've done with Draft Deeper in the past, and I'm glad that we can carry that tradition over to the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed, right, to have a show dedicated to that type of content. So we called it Home and Away. My name is Nathan Grubel. You know me on Twitter, at Draft Deeper. And joining me for my first hosted episode – is Keandre, you would know him as Hoop Intellect on YouTube. If you know me, you definitely know who Keandre is because Keandre was in this space doing public draft content before me. So he's already grown his YouTube channel. I think you have over 40,000 subscribers on YouTube. That, that, talk about a grind. I can't even imagine the, the YouTube grind to the level that you've done it. So I'm, I'm pleased to be working with Keandre on this podcast episode. Like I said, first time. We've done some content together. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, uh, that was a really good intro. I appreciate you having me on the show. And yeah, like you said, I've been watching you guys kind of do different stuff um, throughout the space. So it was cool to see you um, kind of come together, make no ceilings and do all the dope work that you guys do now. So yeah, appreciate you having me on the show. Oh, come on. This, this is a no brainer, man. And again, Hoop Intellect on YouTube. Please go subscribe. Check out his YouTube content. He already has part one and part two of what he saw from the first week of college hoops. That was a little bit before what we got to see in the champions classic. We're going to talk about some of the players from the champions classic, a few other guys who have certainly stood out to Keandre myself as well. That's really the point of this podcast episode is to get a fresh perspective on what's going on in college basketball. But yeah, your videos, you got over 40 minutes of content out about some of the top prospects that have already played. So seriously, go check that out. But Before we talk about some of the players, Keandre, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to really share for the No Ceilings listeners, just in case they haven't seen your content or really heard you yet. You know, who are you? What's kind of your background in scouting and basketball content creation? What's kind of led you down this path to to where you are right now, which to me is a success? Yeah, so I think about, I guess it's just easiest to start at the like beginning of it. Um, So I was in college and I felt like I needed to kind of find a way or a niche to to kind of make basketball content or find a way to to put out basketball content because that is, you know, something I really love doing. Um, And also just sort of the college run stuff wasn't allowing me to do some of the stuff that like I actually enjoyed. Um, So I made Hoop Intellect, started off doing a lot of different highlight stuff, highlight stuff to kind of sharpen my skills and get better at uh, editing videos and Photoshop and things of that nature. And also at the same time, kind of drawing viewership in because if I'm going to watch, you know, Alex Caruso games or Alex Caruso highlights, um, I might as well put it all together into one video and put it out for the people. So that was one of the things that I did early on. That video got like 700 K views because like at the time Bleacher Report, they weren't, you know, making videos on those type of guys, you know, doing stuff like Jonathan Isaac and those type of players who we all know and and enjoy and love, but they might not get the same type of press. So that was kind of my, you know, early things in YouTube and content creation. And then from there, um, I had always done draft stuff, like kind of writing and um, doing stuff on medium.com independently and that sort of thing. So at a certain point in uh, I just had decided to to kind of put that on to YouTube and make the draft scouting videos and, you know, all the other kind of videos and content that you see on my channel. So um, I didn't really expect anything to come out of it. I was just trying to test myself and see where I could push myself content wise. And then, you know, the views started coming in and I was like, oh, I should probably take this a little bit more seriously. So um, from there, I just kind of put it put in a lot of work, um, you know, got a lot of different advice and study people and um, talk to different people about things. And that's kind of how we came to where we're at today. Um, and then, you know, obviously the 20 something years or whatever before that, that I've been alive, you know, <laughs> I, uh, 
have just been a huge basketball fan, you know, um, played a lot, you know, talked about it. It was just kind of, it's just kind of something that's always been a part of me and part of what I do. So it's pretty easy to kind of make that transition into, you know, making content out of it. That's where it all starts, right? It starts as being a fan of the game and then really you, you build and, and you grow that passion and that passion when, when you're, making content and really doing it for the right reasons it just oozes out of every single thing you're doing in the space i certainly get that impression from when i'm watching your videos and listening to you keandre so that's why i'm really glad to have you on tonight we picked a group of four prospects who have stood out to us early on in the year i guess we can start with some of the champions classic guys because that was really the big main event that happened um, prior to the, in the week, you're going to be hearing this episode a few days after we record this. We're recording this on Thursday, November 17th. So a few days after the Champions Classic, you've actually already done a Reactions podcast with Raphael Barlow over on the Locked On NBA Big Board feed. So the good news is we're not just talking about those guys. I'll get to get your perspective on a few other players. But two big games, Kentucky and Michigan State was obviously the first game. Anyone who follows no ceilings. You were probably tuning in in some capacity to our live streams of both games. We were live on playback, so I wasn't just watching and, and taking notes. I was quite literally having to react to every single thing live. <laughs> so sometimes when you're talking with other people, it's, it's like a blessing and a curse, right? When you're doing one of those yeah. live streams, you might not always pick up on all the little details, but I think I got a good picture as to what I needed to from the game because Keandre, as you would know, somebody who is making big boards and participating in rankings and mock drafts. There weren't a ton of quote unquote prospects that we were really watching in that game, right? Or a ton of hyped up guys. Kentucky has a few names, Michigan state, AJ Hogarth, I think played pretty well. Jay Nakin still has to prove himself. Uh, Sissoko had a decent game. And then um, Malik Hall, I think is also trying to jam his name into the draft conversation. But if you were watching that game, it was case and Wallace, Kentucky was the guard who everyone wanted to see. So now through three games, he's averaging 12.3 points per game, 5.3 rebounds, six assists, almost had a triple-double in his first game, which was spectacular to see. I know you talked about it. 55.6% uh, from the field, 50% from three-point range, 50% from the line. That free-throw shooting number is a point that I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely talk about in a second. But four steals per game, a 22.1 PER, and a 62 true shooting percentage. Holy cow. I mean, this man is off to one heck of a start. DeAndre, where, where do you have Kaysen on sort of your, your board right now? Where are you kind of seeing him going in the early parts of this draft cycle before we start really breaking down the parts of his game? Yeah, so if I can remember correctly, I think I had him at 10, somewhere in that 10, 11 sort of range coming into okay. the year. Um, so a definite lottery pick, somebody who I think, you know, for some of the reasons you mentioned, just – the way that he impacts the game defensively. Um, he's got, you know, solid size. He's a pretty good athlete and just like the ability to impact the game offensively and be a compliment to, to other guys, set people up is something that's really appealing. And um, yeah, we've seen it so far. Yeah, we have. So I guess my main question to you about his performance in that game. So you were kind of in that nine to 10 range. I, I'm preseason number 10 on my board as well. So you and I have very similar wavelengths. After you watched that game against Michigan State, did it leave you coming away higher on him, lower on him? Or are you kind of just holding uh, about the same where you're feeling? It's pretty much the same. I feel like we saw a lot of like the things that you really love out of him. Obviously, eight steals is going to, you know, catch your eyes every single time. And the ways <laughs> the ways that he got them too were like um, – you know, just high level, high impact. You know, it's not a lot of guys who can really go out and get steals and make plays defensively in the way that ways that he did it. Um, and then, and then also, you know, offensively, there were certain times where you thought he could be a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Obviously, playing at Kentucky, there's going to be a little bit of, uh, you know, weirdness, and the role is going to be different. You know, especially playing against, uh, playing alongside a guy like uh, Savir Wheeler. So that's going to be an interesting relationship to kind of monitor throughout the year. But yeah, overall, I've been just kind of seeing a lot of stuff that I kind of expected out of him. You know, he's shooting a three ball pretty well so far on lower volume. Um, hopefully that continues. And yeah, that's, he's pretty much been what I expected to this point. You nailed it when you wanted to get into some of the, the passiveness to his offensive game that night. Cause that, that was one of the bigger takeaways for me defensively. What we can sit here, we can talk all night long about his fundamentals, right? His technique, 
his feet, his quick hands. This guy processes the game on the defensive end so quick, but it comes back to he wants to play defense. And that's, you don't always see that from younger players, right? Mm -hmm. These guys who they want to guard 94. When I say he wants to guard 94 feet, I mean, this guy's getting steals before they can even get to three quarter (laughs) court sometimes, right? So Case and Wallace is, he has that dog in him. We, We know that about him, but what we saw on the other side of the ball was interesting because he was, he was passing up shots at times. He was killing his dribble in certain moments where I didn't think he should. He wasn't being that same type of aggressive shot taker that we know he's capable of being, right? You mentioned the three-point shooting. The three-point shooting has been good to start the year. We knew that about his game coming in. He can finish at the basket. He's a big, strong guard. He's 6'4", but he's built really well for somebody his size. And he arguably has the best floater in guards that are, at least certainly when we're talking about guys like top 30, top 45, he probably has the best floater game out of all of those guards. So you put these different ingredients together to where he can be a threat in the paint. He can be a threat from behind the arc. He can take that screen. If he's not looking to pass off that screen up top out of the pick and roll, he could take a few dribbles into that jump shot. We weren't seeing him utilize all of those things, though, across multiple parts of the game. If you're sitting there watching that game, Does that concern you just in the sense that we're looking at him as a lottery prospect and what we would expect from a lottery prospect, we would look for a guard like that to be able to take over the game or at least want to take over the game. Should we, should we hold that against him or should we maybe back off of it a little bit? Cause it was game three against a good Michigan state team. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of a combination of both just kind of depending on your perspective coming into the season, really like, I kind of expected some of this out of him. What I was really excited to see was that first game against Howard. He had some plays that were really good getting downhill and spectacular. um, Right. And just using certain things in the pick and roll and everything that you like to see. Um, So it's like, you want to see more of that. And also just kind of the bright lights. This is the biggest game that he's been in to this point in his career. So early on in the year, you kind of expect some of those nerves or, you know, acting a little bit out of character. Um, Cause I remember specifically that play, um, where he got the turnover trying to make that pass out of Savio Wheeler. He had it, he had a pull up jumper and he probably should have taken it. Changed it was frustrating to watch live, man. It was, yeah. So that's the, those are the type of plays that you want to see towards the end of the season. And just for a lot of regard, like you're saying, you know, you usually want those guys to be a little bit more, um, aggressive and creative to, to be able to make that impact, um, especially for a guy who hasn't yet been like the high volume type of shooter because, mm-hmm. you know, um that attracts a little bit different and adds something to the game um that a a different type of guard wouldn't have so um just kind of all those combination of things that's that's why I have him sort of more in that back end of the lottery but um I'm just kind of taking the wait and see approach over the next you know five six seven you know eight games and seeing where he's at with all that and then I guess we can kind of readdress but I just love you know just kind of the the whole complimentary uh, point of his game offensively and then yeah you have he's an elite defender so um it should just be interesting to see where the other players are kind of in relation to him and then we'll kind of take it from there the other thing that's really stood out to me is his rebounding and i mentioned that he averaged five point three rebounds at the top he's one of these guards and keandra i don't know if you've noticed this a little bit more in your scouting of some of these top prospects but just a few years ago even i don't always remember when I'm taking notes on a lot of these guys writing grab and go ability and transition as like a legitimate strength, not just something that they can do. This isn't just case and Wallace's grabbing a long rebound off of something that comes out to the free throw line, or even as far out as near the three point line. This man is actually getting real tough defensive rebounds. And then his ability to push and hit those quick hit aheads or take it all the way himself. I mean, that type of transition offense, it's not just a strength of his, It's something I'm noticing with a lot of prospects lately. I don't know if that's something that's kind of stood out to to you, not just about Kaysen, but about a lot of this, a lot of the guys in this draft class. And in general, what are some of your thoughts about Kaysen's transition game and kind of where that's been going for not just the big men who are trying to handle the ball, but these guards who are getting much better at defensive rebounding. Yeah. I think that kind of goes back to just his overall mentality as a player, just being that dog on the defensive end and not being afraid to, to kind of go in there and go inside amongst amongst the trees and not being afraid to, you know, see those elbows and everything going for the ball, but it's definitely an asset for um, him and these other, some of these other guards in this class um, 
to be able to to go get it off the glass and be able to push the break just immediately without having to to go into that outlet um you know taking that extra time so um yeah for sure it's definitely a big asset of his game um that I think is going to only help him going towards the next level. It's awesome. It's it's really fun to see that that up and down transition game. It obviously makes it a much more enjoyable experience for for not just scouts like us who are watching all of these college games, but certainly the viewers, especially in those big moments like Kentucky or in Michigan State. If there's one thing that you wanted to see from Case and Wallace as the year goes on to either help solidify his stock, kind of where you have him, or potentially even move him up a little bit, what would that one thing be? Yeah, it's definitely, we touched on it, just being a little bit more aggressive, taking advantage of certain opportunities, um, you know, attacking those closeouts hard, one dribble, two dribble pull-ups, um, whatever the case may be, getting to that floater, just taking advantage of all the opportunities that are there for him right now, because like we kind of mentioned earlier, the Kentucky situation is always a little bit different in mm -hmm. the type of roles that they play. They're still trying to integrate, you know, guys like uh, Reeves and everything like that. So um, that'll grow and change over the course of the year. But just taking advantage of his opportunities, being more aggressive, getting downhill um, with a little bit more regularity is something that you kind of want to see out of him towards, you know, over the course of the year. They need somebody with his size and strength at the guard position to be able to take over those games right. late, right? Because, I mean, Chris Livingston, we can talk about him as another prospect, but I, I don't think he's ready for that kind of a moment yet. He might be another yeah. one of these. Maybe he comes back in year two. Like, we do we yeah. even know that he's going to be a this year draft prospect? We know what Severe Wheeler is capable of, but you want somebody with a little more size late in the game to kind of get downhill and really take over some of those moments. Oscar Shibwe is their other really good college player who – yeah, he, he's the de facto captain of that team to an extent, but he needs to be fed the ball. And then you mentioned Antonio Reeves. I have loved his shooting ability on the perimeter, but he's another one of these guys. He's a catch-and-shoot threat. He's not really creating for himself or, or creating too much for anybody else. So they need Cason Wallace to be that guy. I'll be very curious to see if he is that guy moving forward. So we started with a player who we had some questions about does he have enough or, or is he willing to bring enough on the offensive end to help his team? The next guy that we can move into in the other game in the Champions Classic, Keandre, this guy, he does not have those questions. Grady Dick has been an unbelievable guard slash wing. Wh whatever position you want to classify him as, I don't care. He is a basketball player. He is not just a shooter, though. And I think that's the label that he would have gotten coming in, right, is – Oh, he went to Sunrise Christian. He's this really, really awesome perimeter shooter. What else is he going to do on the court, though? Is he going to be able to defend at an acceptable enough level? Is he going to be able to make enough plays for others? Is he going to be able to get downhill and finish at the basket in, in, in traffic? 16.3 points per game through his first few contests, three rebounds, 1.3 assists. But really, it's the shooting splits that we need to pay the most attention to, right? 57% from the field, 43% from three, 75 from the line. So we had an idea coming in. Kansas has a number of guys who can facilitate offense. They have Dewan Harris, who I don't know how you felt about Dewan Harris, by the way. I, I think he needs to be mentioned a little bit more as a draft prospect. Um, Jalen Wilson has been handling the ball a lot for that Kansas team. They have a number of guys who can set up Grady Dick, but he's actually been assertive and not just looking for a shot from deep. He has gotten downhill, and he has had some of the most impressive finishes. I've seen from any prospect that we can talk about in the top 30 right now. How, how much have you come, maybe come up on Grady Dick? Were you already high on to begin with in your standing pad? What, what did that game, particularly against Duke, really do for you as far as Grady Dick stock? Yeah, he's another one where it's been kind of par for the course for me personally. I've okay. seen him for um, a long time. I actually, I hate bringing this up because I feel like I'm doing it too often now, but like, um, <laughs> Tell stories, he man. Any any war stories you got? We love them here. <laughs> right. He uh so he played with my younger brother in high school. Um okay. I played with his two older brothers in high school. So I know him very well. I played against him several times, pick up sessions. Um, and that finishing actually is like something that I've noticed for a long time. Just his ability, his touch, you know, ability to change um and have body control in the air. That's something that's been a real big part of his game. But you're right, like you don't always know how much is going to translate to the next level, but I felt like his game was pretty well-rounded um, more than kind of advertised. He's a better athlete than advertised as well. So somewhere for me 
coming into the year. He's in that like 15 to 20 range. Um, okay, so you are, you are higher on him than where at least I think we've been as far as no ceilings, which is great to hear. Yeah, so um, that's just my, been my perspective so far. But yes, um, the Duke game was a special one, especially down the stretch. He had those seven points at the end of the game, kind of won them the game, especially with those two stops I think he had on uh, Jeremy Roach and yep. Mark Mitchell. The defense, the end. we don't have as many questions, right? Right, exactly. That's that's That was a one uh, big question, so we got to monitor that out, uh, throughout the year as well. But, yeah, he's just one of those guys who's a basketball player, like you said, just somebody who's going to make an impact in whatever way it is. The back cuts, um, really timely, just throwing lobs to him. He's got good size. Like, he's just somebody that you want on your team. Now, we can yeah. talk about, like, the grand scheme of things, like the, the overall upside and maybe certain things that he can't do, like, creation-wise. But Go go into and, it. Like, wait, let's – yeah, why, why even stop? Go into it. Like, what what do you think – or – Maybe not if we, we we don't always have to project all the way out to the NBA, right? Yeah. Like let's talk about improvement through this year. We've seen him involved enough off the ball. You mentioned a lot of the backdoor cuts, the the lob potential that he's already shown with Kansas. He's been a guy you could put the ball up for him. Dewan Harris was getting him the ball. He can finish those lobs. So he is a really efficient off ball player. But do you see him taking on some more on ball responsibility as the year goes on? Um Partially, I just feel like this this Kansas group um, is kind of by committee, just naturally, just the way yeah. that it's set up. Um, and he knows his game, right? So he's not going to do a bunch of things that are sort of out of the the realm of his his game. Like even if you go back and watch his junior year at Sunrise when he's playing with Kennedy Chandler and Kendall Brown and Jaden Akins, he played a little bit differently than he did his second year when he had you know the the kind of responsibility to do a little more. Um, so I think it's all of a, a bit of a process, but, you know, over the course of the year, I think we see him continue to just take advantage of what is there presented to him, taking what the defense has given them um, with those, you know, the kind of continuity, the continuity that they have in their offense and the dribble handoffs and everything like that. So that'll be interesting to monitor. And then everything else like that he does that we see him do, we can kind of change the projection or, you know, what might be possible over time. But yeah, I think, you know, He's somebody who is going to have a lot of fans come next June. I would agree 100%. I mean, the the efficiency that he's doing everything at, the mentality that he's playing with. You you also mentioned a little bit the defense, how he sort of answered some questions on some of those late possessions there. You just put all of this together in a 6'7", six, 6'8", six package, and he seems like a, a pretty safe first-round candidate at this point. You have him in that, that mid-first-round range. Any chance he rises up to the lottery, depending on what happens with some of these other prospects? You think he could rise that high? I think it's possible. I think he would have to show a little bit more as a creator for that to happen. But that's literally like the the main thing. And also just being a guy who's not going to be a liability defensively. That's another thing. Um, definitely want to see him get a little bit better at screen navigation. I yep. feel like they kind of put him in a adverse situation putting him on proctor especially as he started getting going then he's yep. in constant pick and roll so um but yeah those two things are going to probably decide that but i think he's pretty solidly in that you know 15 to 20 25 somewhere in that sort of range um for me just depending and then like you said like we don't know what's going to happen with some of these other prospects that we see in that sort of general range right now so it, it is possible that he could rise even more because of that reason there were certainly a number of prospects that we could talk about from that game. And we know Duke and Kansas and plenty of these other power programs where we're coming into feast week here, where really a after you hear this podcast on the no ceilings feed that, that Wednesday through Sunday stretch and Thanksgiving week, I mean, we're going to be watching basketball nonstop Keandre. <laughs> I, I already warned my fiance. I, I I'm sorry. I, I, I got to sit down. I got to watch all the games live. Because I, I am I am a procrastinator when it comes to catching up on film, so I would much better be there, much rather be there right. live watching everything. So we look ahead, Grady Dick that we were talking about. You mentioned Tyrese Proctor at Duke. Some of these other prospects in this game, like a Mark Mitchell, a Derek Lively. Is there anyone else from out of that game who you're looking to potentially carry over some of that positivity into some of these other higher profile games? So just a few guys who you're really looking at to perform. Yeah, I really like Jalen Wilson. Um, okay. I think he's had a 
fantastic start to the year. Um, even though he missed all seven of his threes that he shot, I think the shot is looking better. He's still got all the confidence. Um, he had a better start to the year than than, than that game. Um, I feel like it'll kind of average out over the course of time. But he's somebody who, you know, is a monster on the glass, somebody who can defend a lot of different positions, um, is getting better with, with the ball, um, getting to his dribble pull-ups and things of that nature. So just kind of rounding out his game and finally putting it all together this year. Um, taking over for what Ochai Abaji and Christian Brown did last year. That's been something good to see. And right now I'd have him somewhere in that second round, but he's definitely somebody I think at this point gets drafted and has a, you know, big time college season. Is he, is he somebody who teams might start considering in the first round? Like I know it's, it's, Hasn't really been something that's put out there a ton, but my, my fellow co-host over on Draft Deeper, Maxwell Baumbach, he's been a Jalen Wilson guy through this process since he showed out at the Combine before the last draft and is really coming back to us saying, are we sure we should take him out of first round consideration? Like where, where are you at as far as what his stock could be in a few months from now? Yeah, he's a little older. That's kind of one of the, the main things. And then obviously the shot. But other than that, like if he can – continue to keep putting it all together. I, I don't see why not late first round type of range is, is out of the realm of possibilities for him, especially if Kansas is winning, then I think that's just something that's um, naturally going to happen. Cause nobody would have saw Ochai Abaji go all the way to the lottery coming no. into the year last year. Um, even Christian Brown going to, to what was it? 21, oh. I think. Oh, like my that. guy, my guy, Christian Brown. Oh, that talk, talk about a love <laughs> fest over here and draft deeper and then no ceilings, but talk, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, like, it's it's definitely possible. I think he would just have to, you know, continue, um, you know, showing what he's shown so far. Before we move out of the Champions Classic stuff, just a very quick comment from you. You talked about some of the other Sunrise Christian players. Mark Mitchell. Mark Mitchell, I very much appreciate him as a prospect. I think he has a real first-round case. This draft – goes, I think, a little deeper than some people would care to admit right now. Like, you you go out for between 30 to 45 to 50, you're like, oh, snap, there's actually a lot of guys in this range that I might want to take, right. you know, even as high as a first-round pick. Any any thoughts on on Mark Mitchell's, what, what I would deem to be pretty good start to the year? Yeah, I think it's going to get interesting, you know, once Dariq Whitehead comes back, you've got Derek Lively trying to work his way back, you've got Filipowski in there, so, like, I think he's naturally a four, but this Duke team doesn't really have that sort of natural place for him to kind of slide in mm -hmm. and, do, and do his thing. Um, so, and I think he's a definite work in progress as a shooter. That'd be my, my main drawback for him. Um, but his energy on the glass, you know, just somebody who's, you know, going to be able to drive with that left hand, get to a certain, you know, get all the way to the basket and, and score inside and do – you know, a number of different things is definitely intriguing. I think he showed that he's still a little bit young in this in that game yep. um, against Kansas, but he's somebody who you definitely want to watch throughout the course of the season, like a Tyrese Proctor, um, like Lively, of course. And I think they're going to have to be the main people of this team because this Duke team isn't very deep. Like, it's really young. They've got Roach as the only person who has any real experience on the squad, and they're just kind of going. So – it should be uh, interesting to watch what he does. They they need him to step up in the front court. They, you talked about yeah. the lack of depth. They really don't have in the front court, right? Like they, when when Lively's out of the game, it, it's they, the entire offense is running through Filipowski essentially, other than what Proctor's given them and some of the pick and roll reads. And they were running through a few actions where he was getting those jumpers near the free throw line, which thankfully right. he started knocking down in the second mm -hmm. half of that Kansas game, but. Outside of those two big guys, it's like Ryan Young. They're going to like on the bench. Like they they need legitimate front court depth and Mark Mitchell has to be the guy to give it to him. So I'm, I'm really curious to keep watching him moving forward. Speaking of front court pieces, the third guy that we wanted to talk about tonight, somebody who we actually just had a piece published about him at no ceilings. If you did not read the prospect overview, Maxwell titled his piece, Gigi's big adventure, which was one of the best titles I've heard for one of our pieces in quite a while. I love that, but it really is an adventure for him, right? He reclassified. He's coming in a, a year early to this college experience. And as Maxwell wrote about in this piece, we saw that from two Memphis guys last year 
Jalen Duren and Imani Bates. And it was, it was a, a tale of two different stories, right? It, it worked out completely different for each guy. So Gigi's sort of this next quote unquote big time prospect to take that leak of faith and, and come into the college game. Though so far, 15 points per game, nine rebounds, a half assist, 39% from the field. That seems a little bit low, but we'll talk about why. 60% from three-point range and 62 and a half from the free throw line, a steal and a half per game, 15 and a half PER, 47.2 true shooting percentage. Again, that does seem a little low, but we will get into why. And really it's, I'm fascinated to hear what you have to say about Gigi Jackson. Cause you, you look at his physical profile, this, this six, nine, really tall, big, long forward. And you're envisioning, okay, he's probably coming in playing the four man role, maybe doing a little bit of small ball five for the South Carolina team that again, we talk about front court depth. They don't really have a lot of that. And then you watch the film and it's like, oh, is he actually like this next big jumbo wing that's all of a sudden coming in and they're really not going to use him as a big man. They are giving him all of the room in the studio space to explore. He is creating his own brand of shots, his own brand of pull-up jumpers out of isolation. He's doing some things from the top of the key. He's not being used in that traditional big man sense. And I, as much as I would like to see him involved in a few easier play types, Keandre, I'm curious to hear if if you think giving him this freedom to explore his own offensive game has, has really been a benefit for him and, and can be during this draft process. Yeah, I definitely think it can be um, – you know, a real benefit to him and his overall development as a player, just being able to to kind of experiment and work through certain things and hopefully, you know, kind of work through some of the shot selection, a little bit of the, you know, predetermining at times and, um, you know, a, a few turnovers here and there. Um, but yeah, he's a really interesting player. Like, you don't know, especially for like the 17 year old, the guy who classes up, you don't know exactly what you're going to get every time. And that's especially true here. Um but I think he's done a really good job. He's a really good athlete, somebody who has made a, a, a true impact on the glass, um, somebody who has been really versatile defensively, whether that's, yeah. you know, guarding out in space, um, in the pick and roll. Um, that's something that I think I've liked to watch the most out of him in these first two games. Um, but yeah, just I, I just, there's like one play that sticks in my mind where he, you know, had the crossover at the top of the key. Um and he he got downhill. That was like a, a really special type of play. That that sort of wing score. Um, is you want to see more of that, right? Yeah, where a lot of the like, right, like the the long term appeal comes from for him. Um, so yeah, like I don't know. I just I just want to continue to watch, especially going into like SEC play, what he's able to do and um, the role that they have him in, because I do think there's a lot there to kind of uh, work with. It's just you know, how much is there? Where is the shot at completely um, is kind of what I'm watching. You mentioned a lot to work with there. There, there clearly is. And and the jump shooting is one of the things that I wanted to monitor through this college and, the, and this pre-draft process, because you go back and you watch some of the high school film. He is a really interesting shot creator. I mean, I, I was seeing some high school clips of him, like, creating step back threes from the corners. And I'm just like, well, I did not expect to see this on, on Gigi Jackson's film. And it's, it, it's one thing when you, you see the desire to help his team do whatever needs to be done at the high school level. When they would put him in the post, he would willingly accept those touches. He'd go up, finish with the opposite hand. But then you, you see all of these moments of freedom and you're really seeing a lot of that at South Carolina I do like it at the same time, Keandre, let me just share, share a little story with you really quick. So the last player that I evaluated who I can think of is really like college's form of, of silly putty. And what I mean by that is I think there's so many different ways you could mold Gigi Jackson into a basketball player. The last time I saw this was with Marvin Bagley. I thought Marvin Bagley had ridiculous upside and he could be, whatever type of player that I think an NBA team would draft him to be. But when you drafted him, you had to have a plan for how you were going to develop him. And I think a lot of those same things, in my opinion, would need to be said with Gigi Jackson. I would 
I would caution a team drafting him without a plan to develop him, right? If you have this idea where he can be this big jumbo shot creating wing, go for it. If you think he needs to play another type of role within the offense, develop him that way and go for it. Don't just leave him on this island to where we just want to see what you can do on the court without any sort of plan behind it. And that's that's sort of a little bit of a pitfall I see with these really talented basketball players and where they get drafted. Do you do you kind of feel the same way with Gigi? I yeah, two guys just popped into my head when you're you're talking about that what you're describing. Um, one of them is Jonathan Kaminga, who we've obviously seen yep. um, been in, in sort of an adverse situation with the Warriors, and that's kind of um, and I think that they're they're not the same player at all, but like they have similar you know things in there. So the um, the one day the Warriors like being, are asking Kaminga to pull up from the perimeter, the next day they're using him as like a a, a role man at the fuss. Draymond Lock or whatever, right. right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the one thing I think. There's a um, Another guy who kind of popped up earlier, I thought you were going to say initially, was Kevin Knox um, at, Ken- at Kentucky. Um, that yeah. kind of – and then going into the Knicks. But, yeah, there's like – there's something to be said about certain wings who aren't 100% great at, at like that shot-creating role um, coming in or don't have the freedom at that next level or just don't have a plan. They're just rolling the balls out. Hey, go figure it out. And you have um, no sense of direction development-wise. Um, and that never leads to anything, you know, really progressive uh, for a lot of players. And then there's also a lot of different other things that go into like why a certain player might not be successful yep. um, just for them personally. But yeah, with Gigi, it's just kind of like, hopefully he's, he's um, even this year with, with South Carolina, just give him a little, you could let him do everything, you know, mm-hmm. use him as a screener at certain times, let him get a few face up touches um, and, and explore that a little bit. Um, and then do some of the, the initiating and, and few things that he has done. I can pick and roll a couple times um, because I think it's all going to help him. And then um, you kind of get to see where he is as a player and what kind of makes most sense going into the next level. Yes. But for him having that defense and if that sticks, that's the thing that is like, okay, we know we can rely on this and everything else will hopefully just kind of come to fruition. What stood out to you the most? about the defense because you brought it up multiple times and it's funny if you look at the numbers and you look at the steal and block percentages which is one of those indicators that a a lot of scouts and evaluators like to use as are you going to be that same level of defender at the very least defensive playmaker in the nba his percentages are really low but if you watch the film you actually watch the film not just you know scout by the box scores or whatever sports reference is going to tell you (laughs) There are some things that you see on tape that are really encouraging about what he could do at the next level. So what what's some of what you've seen on the defensive side? Yeah, I think, you know, just some of his footwork, the lateral quickness, being able to to guard multiple positions, you know, stay solid in certain situations and also kind of the energy that he brings to the floor. There's been, yep. you know, moments of like real passion on that end of the floor that you like to see. Um, and yeah, just being able to, to kind of, make an impact on that end has been something to um, that I've really enjoyed watching. And, you know, early in the season, like really early, the, the steel and black rate is going to be kind of, you know, flimsy to lean on. I know, I think they're playing tonight um, as well. So we'll see what he does kind of tonight and then kind of go from there, uh, especially defensively. But uh, um, yeah, there's been a lot of different things within um, the game. I wish I had like a clip that I could pull up because there's one in my mind specifically, <laughs> but um that I could kind of, you know, use as a reference, but there's just been a lot of different little things that he's done uh, over these two games that I've really liked to see. So his, his six, nine size, his strength, his mobility in multiple right. situations, right? The, the, the up and down game, the, the lateral quickness, his ability to recover and make a play. Then you talk about offensively, the, the shot creation, the perimeter game, the ability to finish strong, be a leaper, vertical spacer, handle the ball a little bit, the talent pool is ridiculous, Keandre. If if anyone's listened to the Draft Deeper podcast, they've heard me utter this comparison. And I say this very carefully, Keandre, because I have never used this name for a prospect before. And I'm not saying it's the perfect one-to-one comparison because passing in the half court would be the one glaring thing that I don't see to really make this comp fall short. Although some of... 
GG's uh, reads, his hit ahead ability in transition. I think I've seen a lot of good passing there. There's some Chris Weber to, to this man's game. And when I utter a name like that, if people don't remember how good of a prospect Chris Weber was in college, I would strongly encourage anybody to go back and watch some of that film and talk about one of the most talented, quote unquote, power forward prospects I think we've seen in, in quite some time. I think Gigi Jackson has a ridiculous talent space, very similar to that. Am I, am I crazy? Am I kind of sort of down a, a decent path here? Where, where, who do you kind of think of when you watch Gigi Jackson? Yeah, I haven't like really sat down and thought about it too much. The only thing I would say there is like, I feel like Gigi probably slides three, four ish a little more than C Webb going four or five. Four you five, know, yep. Um, I know a lot of people have kind of kind of talked about like Gigi being able to play the five. I don't know if I completely see that there. Um, he there's potential that he keeps growing and kind of fills out and is able to do that um, at the next level, especially with like the way that the league is going. Um, if you can do certain things well, you can be Bam out of bio, be six nine, you can be Draymond, <laughs> be six five and play center. Uh, but you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really kind of sat down and thought about what the the sort of perfect comparison is, but talent wise, I get like kind of the the where you're going with that. E- either way, I I think he's he's an incredible prospect, and I would be shocked if he didn't go top ten on draft night. I personally would be shocked. There's been, I've seen some mocks have him as low as, you know, in the early twenties, I've seen some people have him in like the thirties on their big boards. And I'm kind of looking around. I'm like, I don't don't know what we're doing here. That's that, that, that's great. That seems very inventive and creative, but I think if an NBA team's evaluating him, especially during the pre-draft process, they're going to look at the possible package that they could get. And they're going to look at him and go, we, we, we can't afford to let this guy slip out of the top 10. You kind of feel the same way that eventually we're going to get there on draft night. Yeah, he, he, there's just like so many tools there that it feels like we've just seen it over and over again. Like the, this, these type of guys go in the lottery, you yep. know, every single year. Um, unless you have like the worst year possible and you end up being <laughs> um, Peyton Watson, you still go first round, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's like the that's like the worst case scenario for a player with like this amount of tools and you know being able to show certain things both in high school and you know at the at this level. So yeah, I think I'm still a little bit unsure about like if he's there's certain players I feel like you know when we get the three whiteheads, Cam Whitmore, um, obviously the Thompsons are uh, an enigma in themselves. So that's kind of something to 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 kind of monitor as well, but. I think he's definitely going to be a part of that sort of group. I I agree 100%. I think his name is right in there. And then the last player that we really wanted to dive into tonight was a name. I was actually glad to hear the name, Keandre, because I really haven't talked about him too much since the season started. But I think some of what we can discuss, there are a number of notable things that he's done already in his first few games to signal that, okay, Terquavion Smith is coming back year two. He's really going to show us more of what he's been working on in the summer and possibly break out as one of these guys who last year during the draft process, I was a little lower on him. Then I had some conversations with some people who have been in this game for much longer than I have, who are much smarter than I am saying that type of package that he has, where he is this ridiculous speed guard who has what's seemingly limitless range from three point how many of these guards are actually in the NBA? And if they're such a rare commodity, why are we not talking about Quavion Smith in the lottery? So that made me think a little bit more. And I'm like, well, there are still some questions that I have that I don't know if he's answered from one year of film to where I'm not going to put him that high, but I got him into the early 20s on my board. And I came into this year, I probably have him in the same spot. I don't have him trending up towards lottery yet, but 20 points per game almost six assists per game, 50% from the field, big thing right there, 33% from three, that's taken a little bit of a dip, and 71% from the line, 3.3 steals per game, a 27.3 PER, and a 61.7 true shooting percentage. Keanu, the numbers I would want to point to would be the raw field goal percentage and the true shooting percentage, because last year, those things were not the case for Quavion Smith. He had some real issues finishing around the basket. His two-point percentages were low. 
people had questions as to whether he had the ability to make those shots, whether he had the touch. We can get into some of a, a little bit regarding the why, or at least my opinions about that. What are your thoughts on what you've seen from Traquavion Smith so far? Like, where, where did you finish with him last year? Where, where do you have him this year? Yeah, he was in that sort of same general range for me with basically kind of all the same concerns. Um, okay. You know, if you if you have synergy, you probably saw his name on the finishing um, at the very bottom very often <laughs> if you, you did some of those searches. Yeah. Um, that was a huge thing for me. Um but, you know, what he does do, like his abilities and the, the dynamic that he has with being able to shoot like he can and um, play in the pick and roll like he's shown and, um, you know, that athleticism jumping off that right foot, dunking with the, the left hand um, is something that you, you know, you really have to like uh, in a player. Now, in addition to the finishing, just you kind of want to see a little bit more from him decision making wise and passing yes and then also defensively um because those things kind of help complete his game and make him you know less of a sort of liability in certain situations and he looks a little bit bigger physically which is a big thing i think he was listed at like 160 last year um which you know there's certain play like we talk about bones highland or um emmanuel quickly like they're they're able to to, to figure it out but yeah, those are the main things that I've been wanting to see from him. And so far this year, I have seen a lot of that, you know, come to fruition. So um, for me, I'd have him definitely in the top 20 right now and um, just kind of projecting forward. His confidence as a, as a scorer and a shooter, he just makes sense as that next guy who is like a like the bones and, um, you know, people will throw out like a Jordan Poole, kind of mm -hmm. filling that sort of role for, for a team in the future. So, yeah, he's probably – he might be my favorite guy to watch – um in this draft he's up there he's probably like top five but um yeah i really like his game what he can do was the, was there anything that stood out to you so there, there's really three pieces to his game that, that i think we can break down and you you sort of mention all of them so the the first would obviously be the finishing was there anything on the tape because i know that you're you're making all these videos you are one guy who i trust who actually will sit down and study all the tape is there any one thing in particular you saw with the finishing where you went okay, this makes sense as to why these numbers are this low, or was it sort of a, a combination of different things? It was it was kind of a combination. I think part of it was just like raw physical, you know, things, just being like getting knocked off certain situations and, and, and missing um, um, at times versus certain length that he went up against, especially in the ACC. Um but right now he's shooting 72% from two. They haven't played the, the greatest teams. I think they played uh, Florida in, Florida International last. Um, but it does look better. He looks like he's handling that a little bit better. You know, there's a little bit uh, more craft to to what he's got going on. Um, and I just – I'm really curious about that because that was like the one big setback, and I would understand yep. why anybody would want to be lower on him for that because, you know – teams are just going to funnel you down. And then if you can't do anything versus especially against a drop big, you got a Brooke Lopez in the paint, like, you know, you're just not going to be able to get your game off in, in a lot of different situations and ways. So um, that was a big thing. But other than that, like I kind of need to refresh my memory a little bit because um, I feel like there's something else that stood out to me when I was look, looking at that because it was something – because the number was so low where I was like, I have to figure out what this is, but I can't remember exactly. So, but those are some of the things I remember. I could say for me, I think the biggest thing that I've talked about with a few people off the air is he the angles that he took to get to the basket were yeah. really poor last year. So you mentioned one of the biggest things, arguably the biggest thing, which is his physical stature. He's a 160-pound guard trying to go against bigger guys in college trying to finish in some of these crowded front courts. We obviously know that with the college game. And then he's trying to finish through contact against some of these six, 10, seven foot guys to where, yeah, a lot of these shots probably aren't going to go in. I think he's taken much better angles to the basket already this year. You mentioned that the two point percentage, it's also showing up in the free throws. I understand that yeah, a high level scorer. I think we probably want those free throw attempts to be around like the six per game mark, but still, 4.7 attempts per game up from 2.7. That already tells me he's getting better trips to the line more frequently 
in my opinion, because of how he's actually attacking the basket. And that's been a major adjustment I think he's already made so far. And it's helped bring all of his shooting marks up. It's helped his true shooting percentage, his effective field goal percentage go up by nine points already. Then you factor in what he's already capable of doing from the perimeter. I mean, he's already bringing guys out to him. He's making defenders come out to him. He can get by those guys because of how quick he is. So really, he just needs to be able to deal with that last line of defense. And I think if he attacks the basket in a better way like he is now, a lot of those concerns, in my opinion, go away. And then obviously, when it is just one man to beat of, of similar or, or not too much bigger than him, he can sky over all those guys and dunk at home, right? We, we, you, you've probably put together enough of those highlight yeah. tapes where you're like, man, this guy has real bounce in the backcourt. So that's been one thing that has stood out in a positive way to me. You touched on, you touched on the defense. I think as a point of attack defender, he's been improved this year. We've seen that from the steals numbers off the ball. I still question if he understands what's going on. And that's certainly a a conversation that can be had. But the other thing offensively, the playmaking, do you think he's a good passer? Like if you had to rate his passing, do you think he's about average? Do you think he's good? Do you think there's a world in where we can see him become a, a great passer or am I even wrong in asking that question? And maybe, maybe he doesn't need to take a major jump as a passer. Maybe with his scoring ability, he kind of just is who he is and that can be serviceable enough for, for an NBA team off the bench. Like where are you at with his passing? Yeah, I think that he's looked better this year. That's been the main thing. Um, Obviously he played off of Darion Sebron last year. So that was a little bit different than the role that he has this year, but just kind of being able to, find certain basic reads in the pick and roll is something I want to see out of him because somebody who's going to have the ball, you got to be able to make, you know, solid decisions, find the open man. Um, I think that if I were to kind of classify it right now, I would say he's especially heading towards the NBA. I'd say he's somewhere from average to potentially, you know, above average, maybe into that good range. Um, I would agree. Uh at one point, at some point in the future, but um, I still think there's certain steps that he's got to take, and you know, just having the ball, having this type of role this year is going to be good for him um, long term. See, I think I think Jay Nivey's a good passer. I don't think he's ever going to be a great passer, but I think he's a good one, and he can make all of the reads that you want him to out of pick and roll or in different situations and transition. That's the Terquavion Smith passing package that. I want to see. I want to see Trapevion get to that level to the point where he's not a liability, you know, sharing the ball with everybody else, making the right plays for everybody else. You can trust him to make those very simple, basic reads to where you feel much more at ease when he has the ball in his hands for, for higher usage roles, right? If he's coming off an NBA bench and he's going to be the main guy who has the ball in his hands, you see him have these 27.5% usage usage rate in, in his freshman year, 286 usage rate in in his sophomore year now if he's going to be in a very similar role at the nba level you want to trust that he's not only out there to score but that he can make something happen if the offense breaks down for him and i think i think he can get to that level which brings me back to really my last question for you about him keandre so with Traquavion smith we can outline some of the special scoring ability the the touch on his shots the improved finishing the lights out three point percentage. We get we get what all of that means when it comes together with the speed. If he's a microwave guy off the bench and he isn't a starter, how high are you taking that type of player in the draft? Like this is more of a, a philosophical question. Like, uh, is that guy worth a top twenty pick for you, or, or do you now come back to well, if he's not starting for me, I'm not going to look at him until X spot the draft. Yeah, I think if you are super confident in a player that's going to be a just like more, mainly a, a microwave score, that's like 20s to, you know, 30s range, depending on the, the teams and um, the kind of roster that you have in place. Um, but I, I think he's got a little more because even if you look at like a guy like Jordan Poole, obviously he comes off the bench most of the time, um, but like he's getting paid a certain amount for a good reason obviously there's a whole bunch of things that's going into his play um at the start of this year that 
you know, people could get into. They, they are very similar players, they, though. Like, I hear that comp all the time. And, like, that that is a legitimate comp to me if more of the finishing comes around, which it has now. So let's see more of that comp. Yeah, so I think it'd be more just in kind of a sort of potential role that he could kind of play for a team. Um, but, yeah, like, if you – I don't know. the All the players that I feel like I was really confident in just being a um, – microwave score or that you know lead guy off the bench kind of went more second round top 40 type of range early you know mid 30s but the bones the quicklies yep. they had a little bit more um and then you got like the maxis who i felt was a a lottery pick um so that that uh, there's kind of the Ty- tyrese maxis man outside. one of what one of my misevaluations <laughs> out of all of the mistakes I've made in the draft, I think Maxi's the one I regret the most because I always pride myself on evaluating players based on their work ethic and, and who they are as people. If I'm able to speak with anybody or speak to any, any private connections mm-hmm. and, and get more of that feel as to who they are. And I am blown away by everything that I hear. I want to. I want to not only root for that guy, but obviously, I want to grade him appropriately. I want to have him high enough up on my board. I had Maxi in the twenties in that draft, and that's not anywhere close to where he would go right now in a redraft today. So, talk about draft blunders, and it's it's interesting you say because you brought up you brought up Jordan Poole, you brought up the quickly the bones, you throw out Maxi. Like there are a number of different ways that Jaquavion can go. If you have even the slightest inkling that it could end up as as high in a scenario as maybe close to somebody like a Maxi, like it isn't that sort of answering the question in a way where maybe we do need to be talking about Jaquavion in the lottery. Yeah, that's what that's kind of my base and around him being in that, you know, outside of the door right now. Um but kind of interested in seeing like where this could possibly go because he does have those traits. Um, and he's like really exciting, somebody who puts a ton of pressure on the defense. So you just kind of want to see him um, work on certain things and think a little bit more long term with him, um, just like we've seen with with certain guys in that c- kind of combo guard role in the league. Well, Keandre, this was certainly a fun podcast to be able to do with you. I know I certainly learned some things. And I think the the one thing I would love for the audience to take away is, like I said at the top, your passion for the game really came through on this podcast today. We're talking about NBA guys. We're talking about players you've seen at the high school level going back even you know before college. And obviously, we're talking about guys who are in college. You're, you're watching all levels of the game, right? And that's what the best evaluators, the best content creators have to be doing. You need to be studying where these guys are coming from, where they're at now, and know the NBA game to be able to evaluate where they're going. And I see that from you. So certainly... Your perspective was really awesome to have on the Home and Away series on the No Sons NBA podcast feed. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. One more time for the audience, man. Plug everything that you're doing in the content creation space because I think if our audience, for whatever reason, wouldn't be following you already, they need to be. So let them know. Yeah, man. Um, so you can find me on YouTube at Hoop Intellect. Um, do a lot of draft stuff on there. I've got a big sort of first look video coming at the end of this week or early next week. Um, follow me on Twitter, Hoop and Alex. Um, post a lot of clips and everything on there. Just kind of talk about certain things that's going on and I'm on Instagram as well. So, yeah, but I appreciate you having me on the show. I appreciate you, um, you know, all the compliments that you've given. I really like the stuff that you guys are doing again. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Absolutely. And then thank you. The biggest thank you always to everyone listening to this episode of the podcast. If you aren't following No Ceilings on Twitter, please go do so at No Ceilings NBA. If you aren't subscribed to the Substack, I also don't know what you're doing. You, you really need to be checking us out every day, Monday through Friday, our written Substack, No Ceilings NBA.com. We are pumping out content every day, all year long. Even got some pieces going out on the weekends. We have Stephen Gillespie with the Weekend Warriors. So really, Six days a week of content. Who wouldn't want that in the draft space? And then obviously this podcast feed, make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, subscribe, rate, review, all that fun stuff. We certainly appreciate any reviews, any ratings we see come across for this podcast. So thank you all sincerely for tuning in. 
Until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.